What is up, everyone? Good morning, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. Good evening, even for some of you. And um, I'm really grateful to be here again. Uh, healthy body, healthy mind, healthy spirit for another family education and support group. Uh, in this channel, if you're new, we do some pretty cool things. So this is for anyone who firsthand or secondhand has experienced any type of pain, psychological, emotional, physical, as a result of mental illness, addictions, trauma, or grief and loss. So when you really think about it, that is a wide range of human beings. So my hope is that the content we talk about here helps you and supports you and assists you in getting from where you are in life to where you want to be. My name is Param. I am your host of this weekly show. And uh, we do this pretty much every Saturday. I mean, I miss some and some sometimes it's a little bit more than others. Hey, good morning, everyone that's saying hi. Uh, I'm live from my parents' house today in a newly remodeled room that we did. And um, the beauty of this channel is the fact that it could be for things like communication, codependency, increasing your empathy, raising your information, knowledge, education when it comes to these topics we talked about, or personal development, performance, mindset, how you can be the best version of yourself, right? And um, it's interactive. So when people say comments, so for example, if my mom and dad said hi, if Bita Jun said hi, or if Sophia said hi over here, I can pull up their comments and you can kind of uh, see the interaction component of it. You can ask questions. Um, all is welcome. Nothing is inappropriate. Uh, I do my best to kind of respond in a timely manner. And all that being said, uh, I do have a master's degree in marriage and family therapy. I'm a licensed advanced addictions counselor. I'm a high school basketball coach and a college educator, um, an enthusiast of the game pickleball. And, uh, you know, I just have some passions here and there, you know, uh, and really this is my platform to kind of come and share some of that love and passion and knowledge that I have with those who might need it in their life. So today we're talking about something that's coming up in the news, something that's coming up in our world. And I understand that not everybody is, you know, I can't wait for the Olympics to start type people, but I want to just talk about the Olympics very briefly of why I think that it's a beautiful moment in time, okay? When you watch, and if you don't want to watch the Olympics, the only thing I suggest for people to watch is at least just watch the opening ceremony. And here's the reason why. So if you don't like sports, you don't have to worry about it because the opening ceremony has nothing to do with sports. If you don't care for amateurs or if you don't care for the, those type of performances, if you just like watching pros and you just aren't into the Olympics, the opening ceremony has a different connotation. Here's what it is. The entire world stops. Okay. The entire world stops. And in that world that is stopping, there are countries, there are people, there are thought processes, there's beliefs, there are ideas, there's values that are so cross cultured from each other that they lead these countries into things like as catastrophic as war, right? Your beliefs and my beliefs don't mesh, so let's go kill each other. However, not that day. That day, the entire world gets together and they wear some outfits that's, that symbolize you know, their, their own beautiful culture and it symbolizes that their heritage and, and who they are and where they're from. And they walk and they got these biggest smiles on their face and each country comes out one by one. Some delegations are very small. They only got you know, five athletes. Uh, Iran has 40 of them this year. And some are just mega massive, like the U.S. And, and Russia and China that have just, you know, teams competing in every event. This year, France is going to have a lot. And you know what it shows us? It shows us that if we wanted to, if we all cooperated, that, yes, we can be in one place at the same time and coexist amongst each other. You know, those circles of the Olympic flag represent the continents in this world. And there's a unity with them. And sports allows for a moment in time to break that and to be able to remember the fact that we can get along. You know, right now we're going to come up to some divisive times in our own country over here. And there's going to be people that have certain beliefs on this side and people that have certain beliefs on this side. And at the end of the day, can you cooperate and can you be 
human beings living in the same society together. Some can and some can't. And the ones that can't, I promise you that in their personal lives, they also have a difficult time detaching from conflict. They also have a difficult time detaching from chaos. They, they don't allow space for other people's thoughts and opinions. They're right about their beliefs at all times. And if you ask their loved ones around them, hey, what's your perception of your mom, of your dad? They're like, oh, they're so stubborn. It's always their way or the highway. They're not open-minded and vice versa, you know, the, the other side too. So um, that's what I like the Olympics for. So I want to teach you the psychological. I got this from psychology today. Four years ago, I did this talk. And I was like, well, when am I going to do it again? Fuck, I'm going to wait four years. <laughs> so I waited four years and I'm going to do this talk again. And um, it's from Psychology Today. It's all research-based. And they wanted to find out what are the psychological traits that these Olympians have that the rest of the people don't have? What is it about them? What makes them unique? And um, what's up, Jim? Good morning, brother. And the, my intention is not to make you an Olympian or an Olympic athlete. I mean, some of you, if that's what you're going to do, bravo, I'll, I'll root for you, regardless of what country you represent. But um, for us, it's to become, how do we become an Olympian in our own lives? How do you channel those psychological traits that Olympians have on those stages they perform on in the stage of your own life, in the things that you do to be an Olympian as a parent, to be an Olympian as a spouse, to be an Olympian as a worker, to be Olympian as a friend, to be Olympian as a human being, what are the traits and how can we apply those to our lives to get the gold medals or the silver or the bronze in life. Okay. So let's get right into it. Again, if you have any comments, questions, if you, you know, you want me to elaborate on something more, feel free to ask. So the first one that they have, and I'll put my little question ticker up there. So the first one is they have a very, very, very powerful ability to cope with anxiety. Okay. Now I want to talk about this for a second because anxiety happens in multiple different ways. One of it's somatic anxiety. Somatic means the body. So you'll feel your hands get sweaty. You'll feel like your face get flushed. Your heart starts to beat. You start to kind of, um, you know, lose focus because you're anxious. Your thoughts are going to places that they probably shouldn't go. And that sounds like life for a lot of us. For a lot of you that experience anxiety, you experience those and you're having an Olympic athlete. So here's the thing. Do Olympic, Olympic, Olympians, Olympic athletes, do they or can they eliminate anxiety? No. Performance anxiety is a real thing. You can't eliminate it. But can you live with it and cope with it? You see a lot of your loved ones that probably are the reasons why you're watching talks like this. If you had a loved one in addiction, mental illness, they found a way to cope with anxiety. Grab the bottle. I'm feeling anxious. Pop the pill. I'm feeling anxious. Let me buy a bunch of shit on Amazon. I'm feeling anxious. Let me go date a bunch of people. Now, there are other ways to cope with anxiety. I've been really big. My, my past uh, few months, I've been really big with journaling for myself because it's just really helping me kind of go from a place of being overwhelmed to being a place to be focused. Learning how to breathe. You know, if, if, if you weren't in a yoga class or weren't taking a breathworks class, when's the last time that you took a conscious breath? When's the last time that you set time aside to deliberately breathe? Because my friends, you will never be able to eliminate anxiety ever. You must learn how to cope with it. Olympians have learned how to cope with their anxiety. They learned how to live with it, perform with it. So the goal is to always have as less the least amount of anxiety as possible. But if you're thinking that it's going to be eliminated from your life, and by the way, the bigger tasks you take on, the bigger anxiety it comes with. So you must learn how to cope with this. You must. The next one we have is Olympian athletes have something called extreme confidence. Okay. And I'm not talking about like cockiness because cockiness, people think they're better than they are when they're not. These, these little guys and girls, you know, these, these, these humans are actually very good at what they do. Like it's, it's hard to tell someone that's running a, you know, a four minute mile or, you know, sub four, like a three forty five mile that you're not good at what you're doing. You know what I mean? Like these people are really good at what they're doing. They have an extreme amount of confidence. And where does that come from? 
Confidence is the easiest thing that gets created because it only comes from one thing, repetition. If you want extreme confidence, you must have some extreme repetition over and over and over and over again. Repetition is the mother of all skills. That's what separates these individuals. That's how they have the extreme confidence. Many people come, so I'm a therapist. They'll come and sit in front of me and say, hey, I really struggle with my self-esteem. I struggle with my self-worth. I struggle with my confidence. And I asked them something very, very simple. When is the last time that you did something repeatedly day after day towards your desired goals for over a year? And they're like, "Ah, sometimes I do it for a week and then I fall off. I'm like, all right, well, imagine you're trying to learn how to play the piano and you play it for a week and you fall off. A year later, you come to a therapist and say, hey, therapist, I have no confidence in my ability to play the piano. I say, okay, well, tell me about it. Let's talk about it. Maybe there's a psychological block because I'm assuming if you're trying to play the piano, you're at least playing it every day. And they say, no, I tried it for a week and it just didn't work. I'm like, all right, you shouldn't have confidence playing the piano. That would be unfair to all the piano players if you had confidence playing the piano. Are you willing to play an hour a day? If the person says yes, a year later they come and they play a song, they don't look at their notes, full confidence. Man, for those of you who struggle with your confidence, I challenge you to find something to do every day. Do it over and over and over again. See how I speak right now? No notes, nothing. I'm just going straight off the top of my head. The first year of me speaking in life, right, when I became a professional, every time I spoke, I felt like I was going to throw up. Every time I spoke, my hands were drenched. I had pit stains that were just covered in sweat. I would black out. I would run out of things to say. I was hyper prepared. I always ran out of things to say. Always. And afterwards, I said, oh, my God, what did I just do? That was so bad. That was so embarrassing. I had no confidence. Repeat, 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 repeat. What happens? Put me in front of a camera, baby. I'm telling you, these people you see and look at that you admire or respect something that it is they're doing, they get it through severe repetition. For those of you who are trying to become really well-versed in your recovery and feel good about yourself and life and this and that, do it every day. Wake up, make it a part of your life. Do it every day and see what happens. You cannot change something in your life unless you're willing to do something for that change every single day. Yes, every day, every day. The next one we have here is something called mental toughness, which I will give to the people watching this. I'm going to give this one to you. If you are someone who firsthand or secondhand has experienced pain as a result of addictions, mental illness, trauma, and grief and loss, and you are still here watching this saying, what can I do to help my loved one? What can I do to help myself? What can I do to heal? And you've gone through adversity and challenges in your life, maybe from the time you were a child. And right now you're here watching this like many of you are. You have mental toughness. You have it. Now it's a matter of using that mental toughness that you have developed over the course of your timeline in specific and strategic moments towards your obtaining goals. Can you be mentally tough? Can you use all the lessons you learned and apply them to pursuing your greatness? See, Olympic athletes, man, they are so mentally tough. So mentally tough. But guess what? So are you. So are you. You haven't crumbled. You haven't cracked. You haven't broke despite of life doing some pretty intense things to you. What do you think that is? That's resiliency. That's mental toughness. That's grit. That's resolve. Those are the characteristics that help people overcome obstacles in life. You have it. Just use it. I mean, what's the point of having a bunch of stuff in your pocket if you're never going to use What's the point? You have mental toughness. Use it. Don't be afraid of how strong you are. And remember, the universe never puts anything on your back unless the universe believes that you're capable of carrying it. Okay. The next one we have is the ability to focus and block distractions. Olympic athletes, tunnel vision. They have something called tunnel vision. They do not see anything besides what it is that they are trying to pursue. What is life? 
constant distraction. Every day. Every day you, my friend, are getting distracted and pulled to different directions, different places, different people, different things, different bills, different obligations, different duties. And when you get distracted and lose your focus and you miss out on what it is you're pursuing, we start to say that, hey, I can't accomplish my goals. I can't accomplish my dreams. No, no, it's not a you problem. It's a focus problem. We did a whole talk on this last week. If you have not seen it, it gets a little blurry when I move back and forth because my settings were messed up. But the talk is amazing. Go watch it. I teach you all about focus and the power of your focus. Olympic athletes can block distractions and focus on all they can control, which is themselves. Right? So if you are distracted today by a bunch of things that happened in the past or are going to happen, man, I'm telling you, just focus for a day or two and get right with yourself. If you look at yourself in the mirror and you can't even see yourself because you're so distracted by life, go connect to yourself. Go find yourself today. Make eye contact with yourself. Find yourself today. Focus. Tunnel vision. Get back. Snap out of it. It can be done. The next one that they have, these Olympic athletes, they are hyper competitive. Hey, by the way, I do believe in competition. So even though I am a, uh, I am, you know, on sometimes on some, some ways you, you would assume that I'm very uh, a liberal when it comes to a lot of things, which, you know, I believe that I am. I do believe strongly in competition. I am not one of those people that believes that every human being in life should get a participation trophy for everything they get, okay, um, or everything they do, because it takes away the, the beauty and the magic of those who actually try and work hard and grind when no one's watching, right? Now, do I believe, now here's, here's my differentiating factor. Olympic athletes are hyper-competitive in everything they do. They're, they're competitive in everything they do, and it never sh shuts off or turns off, okay? I don't believe that's healthy. I don't believe that as human beings that are striving towards balance, we should not have an off button on our competition. Because if we're competitive too often, too many times, too many years, what happens to many Olympic athletes at the ages of 22, 24, 26, they burn out and don't want to compete in anything else ever again, Okay. So I believe there's only one form of competition that a human being should ever do, and that's a competition with self. Beat yourself. Go look at yourself in the mirror and say, today I will do better than I did yesterday. I will beat my past self in all aspects of life. I will be mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually stronger than my past self. If you do that enough times, your future self will be a beast. Your future self will have their goals, dreams, accomplishments, everything fulfilled. Your future self will be the person you always wanted to be but didn't know how to be. I'm telling you, if you want your future self to be a specific version of you that you do not know how to achieve, beat your past self every day. Every day, honestly, look at yourself and say, did I improve today? Be competitive with yesterday. Make the changes necessary to continue to improve and your future self will take care of itself. The future self will take care of itself. And going back to what I said about, you know, the participation trophies and this and that, here's the thing. I believe that we should be in some type of competitive spirit, whether it's with self or others. However, we also need the stuff for fun too, the balance stuff. For example, when I, um, when I play my pickleball and I compete in it and I try, you know, I always try to play with people that are a little bit better than me so they can kind of like school me and teach me what I need to do. I play with some people that are my same level so I can compete with and try to be the best in that group. And I play with people that they're, they're beginners or sub, subpar with skill levels just so I can have some fun and not be in the competitive mode at all time. Balance. Strive towards balance. This is what we want. If you want to be an Olympian athlete, like a, like a characteristics of Olympia, like gold medal in your life, you got to have balance. You know, you got to have balance. The next one we have is uh, they have elite work ethic. Um. A lot of you might consider yourself hard workers and, and probably some of you are, okay? Um, so I'm not going to discredit that. So I'm not, this is not an attack against anyone. However, I do know that our society as a whole, and maybe you are a part of that society or not, has very, very unrealistic expectations. Our society as a whole has entitlement issues. They believe that they should get something for nothing. Our society as a whole wants above average life with a below average work ethic, 
I, I, I don't subscribe to that kind of stuff. I don't think that those who are trying their butt off and those who are just cruising deserve the same outcome in life. I really don't. I believe that there's certain things that we all deserve, like shelter, like food, like water, like love, like safety. Man, give that to all every human being. Shit, man, I'm giving to animals too. You know me, I'm an animal lover. But if you want things in life, you're not willing to do what you got to do to go get them. Don't blame nobody. You know, um, you know, everything I've accomplished in my life up until this point has been rooted in a foundation of like, you know, decent family that helped me uh, kind of learn things in life and and be a, a decent human being. But outside of that, man, nothing was given to me. I got to work my butt off for everything. I mean, I'm talking about from the bottom. You know, you might look at me and say, oh, this person has some level of, uh, you know, perceived success. But I had to work to get it all. You know, it's uh, the story I always go back is, you know, I'm a proud one of the proud owners of a place, you know, an IOP center in Huntington Beach, California, Buckeye Recovery Network. Great reputation. I love us. I love the humans there. I've been there for, you know, coming up, you know, it's 12 years or so uh, over time. And, you know, I'm one of the owners there. So if someone meets me right now and says, oh, this guy's an owner of a rehab facility, he must he must have been really wealthy or he must be really wealthy. And that's how he opened up a business. For the first seven years of working at Buckeye Recovery Network, I was an employee and I started from the lowest position possible, which is just a drug and alcohol counselor. And I even helped with the urine analysis when the staff would leave at three o'clock to collecting people's piss. And I worked there and I worked there 40 hour weeks, 60 hour weeks, 70 hour weeks. In 2020, my wonderful business partner sat down and said, hey, uh, you know, you, I know we know you want more and we want to bring you in as a partner. And they just for my sweat equity, they just gifted it to me. And all of a sudden I'm a business owner. So if you don't know that backstory, you think, oh, this guy's just lucky, he just bought a business. No, man. Elite work ethic. Elite work ethic. Um, oh, we got Cuz in here. I'm saying, John, thanks for saying hi, everyone. I'm still grinding. Got a few more here to go. We got, uh, so Olympians, they have this thing called a mastery of goal setting. So I've, I always like to ask people the following question. Do you have your goals? Do you have your, let's say one year, five year, 10 year goals. Let's see, actually, can you guys, the ones that are watching this right now, I'm just out of curiosity. Do you have one year, three year and 10 year goals? If you do just say yes, you know, in the, in the, in the side chat, I'm doing a little experiment real quick. So the main question is, if someone asked me, are my one year, three year, 10 year, one year, five year, 10 year goals clearly defined and stated, I want to know if the answer is yes or no to that. But there's a follow-up question, which, you know, I'm not going to sit and wait for you guys to write because people listen to this passively. The second question is this. Are those goals written down somewhere? Do you revisit those goals? Do you read those goals? Do you like those goals? Do you, let's see what we got there. We have one year, three, there you go. Someone over there said they got them all down. So the most important part here is, you know, and I just said in the second part, so Jim said yes, and, you know, uh, Pacific Sands crew saying yes over there. The part that's really, 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 really important is this. And Lance said yes, you know. Um, there you go. Michelle's saying she's going to go get it afterwards. I like this, Michelle. But here's the thing. Yeah, Jim's, Jim's, Jim's getting to where I'm getting to. Figure out my goals. See, Andy, Andy, what's up, buddy? First of all, I remember you vividly uh, in my little small little office over there that we had uh, back in the day. But here's what I'm trying to tell you guys. Make sure that your goals are written down. Three by five card, write down your goals. Make sure that your goals are in places that you visually with your two eyes can see throughout the day. So some of your one by three by five cards might be on the dashboard of your car, might be in the mirror of your bathroom, might be by the bed stand on your bed, might be in your back of your phone wallet, you know, might be 
at your desk at work. The reason why you want to have these things written is because what is life again? When we go back to what I taught, it's all about distractions. Every time you get distracted by something, guess what you're not looking at? Your goal. You're just not. You can't tell me that you could focus on some drama and chaos or some something that's meaningless and also focus on your three to five year, 10 year plan goal at the same time. You can't do it. I don't care who you are. It's impossible. So the mastery of goal settings is you got to create these goals. And then when you have them, this whole visualization that I talk about, the manifestation that I talk about, I know some of you are just kind of like, hey, that sounds too hippy dippy for me. Listen, man, it's been a long, it's been around long before hippies were hippies. Okay. This is like the part that I, I need people to understand is like this stuff that people think is related to like a specific movement of like people that are just kind of like, yeah, you just go manifest your dreams. It's not the case. People have been visualizing, visualizing this development of life for thousands of years because everything in life is created twice. Once inside the mind and once inside reality. If you haven't created it inside your mind, how do you think it could become real? Like think about any invention in life. If the inventor doesn't create it in their mind and just starts building, what the hell are they building? You got to, and by the way, when you visualize it, you have to finish it. So you got to see the finished product. So when you have these goals, you got to see the finished product. For me, when I went back to school, one of them was to get a diploma, like, you know, a, a certificate. So I, I created a fake certificate with my name on it and I would look at it all the time. I'm like, fuck, I don't have one of these, but if I keep going to this class, I'm going to get one of these. Visualize it. I visualize myself on these podiums and championship games and I, and I get there and I'm like, holy shit, I'm there. But it wasn't because I just visualized it because once you visualize, you're like, what do I got to do to make this real? What do I got to do? What steps do I have to take to make it real? So it's, um, yeah, good. There's, there's some good action going on there in the chats. I appreciate it. Now, the next one we have, there's just a few left here. Uh, we did a whole, well, that's from last week. Sorry. Last week's talk on focus was really good. So the next one we have is this thing called coachability. And I think this one's really important for those of you who are in the recovery process because coachability in this case could also be a clinician, a counselor, a therapist, and even a sponsor, a life coach. So coachability is important. Olympic athletes, and they're really good at what they do. They still have coaches to tell them, hey, I think you can improve on this. I don't think you put your best effort there. What's going on with you? Something going on inside your home? Is something going on? You know, are you struggling with something? You just seem a little off. And the Olympic athletes have a extreme powerful ability to be coachable in the moment. Like, for example, if someone says, hey, I think that you did something difficult. I think that you did something wrong right there. The first response could be like, but I did 100 things right before it. And say, I know you did, and that's a wonderful job. But I just want you to know that that one right there wasn't your best performance. And they say, yes, coach. Man, some people in life, if you tell them, hey, I think you kind of didn't give your best right there. And they say, who the hell do you think you are telling me that? Did you not see all the good things I did? It's like, yeah, but I don't. But I'm just telling you that like, that wasn't your best. You know, it's not that big of a deal. And uh, so can you be coachable? Like, Can your sponsor or friends or accountability system, can they tell you, hey, you're not something's off without you getting defensive can you can you say can you go up to people and say hey give me some constructive criticism how can i improve go up to some people and say hey i don't feel like i want i'm not performing the way i want to perform in life i'm not being the father the husband the lover the spouse the whatever it is that i want to be the worker what can i do to get better be hungry for that knowledge be hungry for that information be hungry for that in for that ability to transform let's see what we got here um Lance, visual boards are unbelievable. So a visual board, this is, it takes what I just shared right here. And, and uh, Lance, by the way, just so you guys know, someone that I've been able to observe, let's say for, you know, four months uh, on a regular basis. And it's one of those people that's kind of taking um, an opportunity in his life to uh, start to really go from where he is to another level. Now, it's someone that's always been relatively disciplined but there's always a few things kind of holding him back. And now he's kind of freed himself from those things and realizing that anything and everything's possible. So he actually practices what he preaches, which I, which I respect. So visual, visual boards are a little bit, it's like the next level of what I was talking about with those defined goals, you know, those postcards you put everywhere. 
this could be like you go and it's actually a really fun project. So imagine going yourself to arts and crafts store, just going on Amazon and getting like a 24 by 36 canvas or like one of those like paper boards, like the cheap ones, right? The cheapest ones, it could be paper. It doesn't, this is a very low cost thing. And then you can either go on the internet and find some pictures that you like. Uh, I like to use like actual magazines because uh, it's just, the, I like the feeling of the paper and you can cut around them and you can, you know, glue it. It's like a fun arts and project to do with families or spouses or by yourself. And sometimes you can even buy expired magazines for really cheap. So like, uh, go on maybe eBay and just go find expired magazines that nobody freaking wants. And you can go buy them and just kind of recycle them and use them because who cares? And long story short, you create these visual representations of what it is that you're trying to pursue, what it is you're trying to you know accomplish, become. And you put those in, in places that you can see because now there's an image to it. And when there's an image, potentially there's a feeling associated to that image. You connect those two together and man, you got some, you got some power. Jim, what'd you say? We can't fix our shortcomings with the same brain used to create them. Absolutely. Find a new way to think by getting outside coaching. That's a nice way to, for everyone to understand what's the benefit of it, because you know, you're only, you're, you're limited to your own abilities, but when someone comes in, like if someone does the same thing over and over again, right? Like in, in Jim's, what he's saying here is that you know, it's pretty deep. So let's say there's this golfer and he keeps swinging the golf fucking the golf thing. And can't get past a certain thing. And then a coach comes and says, Hey, I noticed you're doing this a little bit wrong. Try it like this, whatever that is. I don't, you can tell how to play golf. And he does it. And it's like everything improves. And it's like, Wow, he wouldn't have known that because he kept doing the same thing until someone saw. And by the way, where do coaches see the blind spots? Blind spots is what the power of a coach is. They allow you to see things about yourself in which you are unable to see. Because remember this. The eyes cannot see what the mind doesn't know. Write that down somewhere. Your eyes cannot see what the mind doesn't know. Um, what you got here? Wishing for other loved ones still running around, doesn't accept their problem. Yeah, I know. You know, nobody accepts their problem until their problem becomes a problem to them. And it's really nobody's... Uh, I wish we could go out there and get everybody that's got a problem and say, hey, let us help you. But until the problem's not a problem to them, it's actually not a problem. It's weird, but it can get there. So the next one that I have is something called hopefulness. Um, you know, I, it's rare that an Olympic athlete shows up to the Olympics and says, you know what? I don't want to get first, second or third place. They are all hopeful that at the end of it, they're going to be standing on one of those podiums with their national anthem blasting, full of pride and just like taking a journey down memory lane. But we all know out of all the athletes, only three of them get there. But all of them have this unique ability that they're going to get there. And some of you in life have lost hope that things can change. You've lost hope that you can be any different, that life can be any different. You've lost hope and you've lost the so sad, but the belief of the possibility of human transformation. And you want to know why it is? I'm telling you this. The reason I believe that people lose hope is because of their inability to cope with anxiety, lack of confidence, not tapping into their mental toughness, not blocking out distractions, not being competitive, not having work ethic, not having a mastery of goal setting, not being coachable. And as an end result, you feel hopeless because you're just left to your own devices. You know, hope is a beautiful thing. Uh, it's whatever definition you want to give to it. But you just got to make sure that you keep the hope alive because uh, I've seen it all happen. See, there you go. I got most of my hope by watching others succeed with similar issues I was experiencing in their successes. And that's what we do. You know, you watch people and say, okay, if I do what they're doing, Will I get the exact same outcome they got? I can't promise you the answer to that is yes. But if you do what other people are doing, can you get somewhere very close to where they got? I can bet on that one. It's just not going to be the same, but nothing's the same in life. No two fruits are the same. No two fingerprints are the same. No two, man, snowflakes are the same. Your life's not going to be the exact same as someone else, but it could be something pretty um, close. I was uncoachable today by my sponsor, and she is doing 
All she's doing is trying to save my life. We'll dig deeper today and become coachable. So this is really cool because it's, uh, first of all, thank you for uh, acknowledging your own shortcomings because that's, you know, it takes recovery to do that. But see, the, the, the fact that someone can say I was uncoachable today, that's the catalyst to change. Because at least that person, in this case, Michelle, understands that, wait a second, I was, the, <laughs> I'm not saying you're the problem, but I was the problem today by not showing up coachable. Right. And now she's saying, you know what? I'm going to dig deeper. I'm going to roll up, roll up my sleeves, become more coachable and see what's on the other side of it. That's an Olympian. That's like the mindset of change. That's the stuff that people admire in life. You know, so good. Good on you, Michelle. Keep up the good work. Um, the next one is so this one, this last one, I think it says uh, perfectionism. So it had the word perfectionism in there. And I was like, come on, I can't go on a mental health channel and talk about how it's good to be a perfectionist when I just had a video a week ago or, I mean, a month ago talking about the dangers of perfectionism. So I'm not going to do that. But so I wrote about the healthier kind. So if there's a healthier kind, that means I'm going to separate perfectionism. One is maladaptive perfectionism and one is adaptive perfectionism. Okay. The healthier kind and a healthier, healthier is the adaptive one. So the maladaptive perfectionism, please, to God, stay away from it. I don't want anybody, including myself, to pursue perfection when it's maladaptive because, first of all, it doesn't exist. Second of all, um, in the pursuit of perfection, you are riddled and crippled with mental health challenges such as crippling anxiety, feelings of inadequacy, um, take doing things you probably shouldn't have done to, to manage your stress, guilt as a result of doing those things, shame, feeling like you're a bad person, and repeating the cycle over and over and over again, trying to get the approval of others. It's just a bad thing. I've done a video on it. Avoid perfectionism. But the healthier kind, because some of the things in sports are quantifiable, like there are measures, there's numbers. So it's doing what I can to the best of my ability to get to as close as I can to that perfect score or mark or whatever it is. and. Even with that is a little dangerous because it puts the expectation that you have to give a specific type of effort every day. So this one, I, I don't, you know, I'm not too fond of this one because I think a lot of Olympian athletes actually because of this struggle later on in life. Like you tell a little gymnast that's scaled that their, their entire performance is rated against perfect. Like they're going against or like a diver, they're competing against perfect, which is a 10. So whatever they do, and it's not like they say, oh, my performance was a 9.8. They say, I was a 9.8. My performance was a 7. Oh, my God, I'm a 7. I'm a loser. You know, and they do this as a child. So later on in life, it's all bad. So when it comes to perfectionism, let's just not even, let's not even give this one any type of ammo. I don't believe there's a healthy kind. There's a healthier kind, which I said, you know, strive towards it. But you ready? The only thing that you will ever do perfectly is to do the best of your ability on any given day. Your best will change and vary from day to day. Some days your best is a 10 out of 10, and some days your best is a three out of 10. As long as it's your best, it's all you can do. As long as you look at yourself in the mirror and say, even though I was only able to give a three out of 10 today, the three out of 10 was all I had in me, that's okay, because guess what? Have compassion for that person, have compassion for that reflection, Sleep, wake up in the morning, and do your best again. That's all we can do. The only perfection you should pursue is the perfection to always do your best. And it changes from day to day. It changes from person to person. And that's okay. Remember, perfect is the enemy of good enough. Sometimes good enough is good enough. Sometimes good enough is good enough. We don't need to be in this constant quest of trying to get something that's not even real, you know? Um, what do we got here? I'll do better than I did yesterday. Damn right. You're welcome, Jim. Almost done here. I got my last, I think. So in conclusion, today we talked about the 12 psychological components, character traits, personality traits of Olympians. The reason I did the talk is because six days from now, we're having the Olympics 